everyone. Welcome to another episode of machine learning using R. And in today's video, we are going to take a look at support vector machines, SVM. And uh, the agenda is basically going to cover uh, a brief overview of what support vector machines are. We'll take a look at some of the concepts, uh, the background behind the algorithm and how the algorithm itself works, um, a very high level overview, and uh, understand some of the key terms and concepts. And then finally, we'll take a look at a uh, few examples and demos using R uh, to perform uh, SVM-based um, algorithm. Now, SVM itself uh, is what's referred to as a supervised machine learning algorithm, and it can be used for both uh, classification as well as regression problems. However, in the video today and much of the discussions itself uh, in covered in this video will be mostly to do with uh, classification problems. So do keep that in mind as you watch the video. Uh, so again, in summary, we'll take a look at some of the concepts and quickly jump into a demo. Now, the best way to help explain how support vector machines work is if I can use an illustration here. So uh, I've just got PowerPoint here and in a single pane, I've got uh, an, uh, an outline of what a SVM is. And just to illustrate the concept, so SVM, the basic idea is here you have uh, a couple of observations here, or a few uh, a few dozens, if you will, of observations here. And you can clearly see they've been labeled very clearly. So you have these in the blue and here you have in black. So these, basically the objective, if I were given a task, say, to uh, identify or draw a line uh, that can split the two together uh, in the most optimal way, that's fundamentally how SVM works. So as you can imagine, there are several ways that we can split uh, split these two and uh, what the goal is to arrive at that optimal uh, hyperplane uh, which segments it so that there's the widest margin uh, between uh, the line the hyperplane and uh, the observations so to illustrate it a bit better so let's assume that this is an example of a hyperplane of course this is um, a two-dimensional one uh, but again keep in mind this could be multi-dimensional uh, so if I were to keep this line here, so assume again this is the hyperline and our goal is to arrive at the optimal one. As you can imagine there are several ways I can position the hyperplane but uh, here you'll notice there's overlap uh, as you can see in the background behind. And uh, of course one of the options I have is to e rotate the hyperplane and um, change the angle of the hyperplane. You'll notice this might be one of the more optimal angles, uh, but again, um, there could be several options here. So as you can imagine, I could have changed the angle and it's still, you know, it's uh, still uh, kind of like evenly splitting uh, the observations. Uh, the goal again is to find the hyperplane uh, with uh, the the optimal hyperplane. So again, we have found several hyperplanes, but the goal is to arrive at the optimal hyperplane where the uh, the margins are maximized. Uh, so uh, if we were to consider that into perspective, that basically means that if we were to draw, I mean, arrive at a hyperplane such as this, uh, what I've just overlaid, that would um, be the most optimal hyperplane, uh, which uh, ensures that uh, we have the maximum margins, if you will, between uh, what's referred to as these support vectors. So you can see within these very many observations, what we have here are these uh, observations, as you can see here uh, on the line. That's actually what's referred to as a support vector machine. Um, and uh, we'll see more of that as we go through the demo. But uh, again, the objective in this particular linear SVM was to arrive at uh, the a most optimal uh, separating hyperplane. Uh, and that's basically how the algorithm works. So now if we can uh, extend this uh, idea of um, uh, hyperplane, uh, one of the things we can do then is not just use um, SVM for linear uh, kind of like scenarios, but uh, or linear classification, but um, SVM can be uh, very efficient to perform non-linear classifications as well as you can see in these few uh, examples here. 
and uh, SVM is uh, quite efficient and quite handy, if you will, to perform nonlinear classification uh, using what's referred to as a kernel trick, and that basically um, uses um, you know a different uh, implicit mapping, if you will, uh, and uh, taking higher dimensional feature spaces to arrive at that classification. And um, just worthwhile keeping in mind that while SVM uh, is not um, uh, necessarily a cure for all your machine learning uh, ch uh, problems, uh, it definitely is uh, something that you could uh, consider in your arsenal of uh, machine learning algorithms. Um, and historically, uh, while SVM has been around for a long, long time, uh, the late 90s, and uh, you know, uh, it became very, very popular. But uh, one of the challenges back then was uh, computing resources was uh, obviously not uh, as uh, good as it is today. So uh, given uh, the, the pace of uh, the computational resources we have, SVM uh, seems to have come back um, and uh, quite popular these days. Uh, so worthwhile mentioning again uh, that uh, one of the biggest limitations, if you will, um, of SVM has, uh, has always been uh, the speed uh, and uh, the volume or the size of data that we could train uh, as well as test the data. So it's, uh, it's basically because of the complex uh, algorithm, as you can imagine, like um, you can, uh, as we've discussed, uh, arriving at an optimal hyperplane can take a lot of computational resource. Uh, the more uh, features that you have, uh, the more dimensions that you have, uh, it actually it obviously complicates the space, if you will, uh, for which um, we need to arrive at um, the optimal uh, separating hyperplane. Apart from that, one of the other challenges with um, the SVM is um, is how we arrive at uh, the choice of the kernel, uh, particularly for nonlinear uh, style of classification. So all in all, that's uh, that's the background and uh, the context behind uh, the SVM algorithm. So again, it's a uh, it's a uh, you know it's really simple when you consider a linear uh, kind of uh, scenarios, but the minute you start looking at non-linear, it tends to uh, get uh, a bit uh, dicey, and it's um, it's kind of like a black box in terms of how how the calculations and the algorithms are actually performed. So, anyway, so that's the theory. So let's actually get into our and uh, see some code. Okay, so here we are in our studio. I've already pre-typed um, some code here. Um, so just a quick walkthrough of um, the code itself. Um, so step one, you will need to install this um, package. So that's a E1071. Uh, the package houses several machine learning libraries, uh, amongst which today we are going to be looking at the SVM, the support vector machine uh, algorithm. Uh, so let's include that and uh, for purposes of the demo, like most of my other demos, I'm going to use the IRIS data set, uh, which is a, a standard data set that you get with an R. So let's uh, quickly look at the data. Um, again, it's uh, it's got quite many number of um, features here, but um, this is uh, the species is uh, what we would want to predict. So essentially we are going to make use of the other features. Um, quick glance and always the best practice with machine learning is um, one you'll want to look at the data, introspect the data, and uh, quickly gauge what features are more relevant. Uh, so here we can see that we've got the sepal length and the petal length and the sepal width and the petal width. So then it's a good exercise to actually look at the data and here we can actually see that uh, with certain combinations of course or so, um, you know comparing certain features we can already start seeing some uh, segmentation here so visually uh, we can inspect the data and that's always a good first step. Um, the next step is to do some feature extraction. We need to understand which features we will want to use for the SVM. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll take it uh, one step at a time. So let's say, for example, if we were just looking at sepal length and width, and uh, let's uh, separately look at petal length and petal width. Um, so if I've color-coded it uh, here, 
Um, so again, if you're not familiar with the data set, do have a quick look. Um, so that's uh, the Iris data set. Um, it's a, a easy data set to work with. It's got about 150 observations, and um, it's got three different types of species here. Um, so again, for ease of visualization, I've uh, color-coded it. So here you can see, if we use the sepal length and sepal width, um, we can clearly draw a separation at least with one species. But um, with the other two species, as you can see, it's quite interleaved. So it's uh, using sepal width is going to be really hard. So let's take a look at petal width. So here we have a bit more success. So one cluster of flowers, as you can see here, is clearly separated from the others. And then we have the other two clusters. And here it's easier to separate. Um, but uh, uh, again, there are some overlaps, which becomes harder if you start using um, linear SVM. But uh, we'll, we'll take a stab at how well the algorithm does. Uh, so given what we have uh, understood so far, uh, we are going to use the petal width and the petal length um, as features for uh, the SVM. So let's create a sample data set. Um, so here's a random sample from uh, random 100 samples, if you will. So that gives us the index. And uh, since we are not interested in all the features, we'll just um, use the petal length, petal width, and of course, uh, uh, for our training data set, we will capture the label of species. Let's uh, create a data set for the training data. So that has uh, 100 observations. And uh, for the test, uh, uh, we'll create 50 observations. And uh, then finally, we'll, we'll create um, the SVM model. Uh, so here, we would like to predict species uh, using petal length and petal width. That's everything else. Uh, we'll use the training data set. Um, in this particular case, of course, we, as I mentioned, we are using the linear um, uh, SVM and not the nonlinear ones. Um, and uh, here, I'm going to use um, a cost of 0.1, and I'll elaborate what that is. And uh, since we are using a linear SVM, I've set scale to false. Um, I'll come back to the why the cost in just a second. Um, let's just quickly print that. Um, all right, so here you can see based on uh, the training data set um, and the parameters that we found, the linear SVM identified 44 uh, support vectors. You may remember from the diagram I mentioned what these support vectors are. So it's identified 44 number of support vectors. Um, so again, if I um, I run this again because it's going to use um, another random sampling. So here, I'll print that. So again, 44, 46. As you can see, it's um, it varies uh, within that range, but you can see the number of uh, support vectors there that it's identified. Um, let's uh, do a quick plot. So again, this was based on the last run. You can see that it's uh, how it's uh, identified from the model. Uh, again, there are some uh, overlaps or things that didn't come out correctly, but you can see the different um, ways that it's uh, segmented uh, the three uh, different sets of flowers here. So using SVM, uh, this is an example of um, what the training model looks like. So again, if I run this a couple of times, uh, you can actually see how how it's performed uh, in terms of uh, the model itself. Coming back to uh, why this number for a cost. Uh, so one of the things that uh, uh, we can do is uh, do a cross validation um, using the tune function. So again, uh, for the tune function, we are going to tune it against the support vector machines algorithm. Again, pretty much passing the same data set uh, as we did here. So it's all linear. And uh, for the cost, we are going to provide a range here. So as you can see, I've provided a range of costs. And uh, the tune function uh, will identify what is the best cost parameter uh, to be used. Um, uh, just give me a second. Let me try that again. Oh, uh, oh sorry. Uh, there was a extra comma there. Yeah. So Let's uh, take a quick summary here. And as you can see uh, from this uh, summary, for that particular random data set, it um, says that the cost should be 100. So if I go back here and change that to 100, and oops, let's run that again. 
All right, so that's basically how we identify uh, the optimal cost parameter using cross-validation. Uh, and then now that we have the data, let's uh, quickly uh, predict uh, uh, the, uh, the, the labels uh, from the training data, uh, I'm sorry, from the test data set. Um, so again, um, this is a classification problem. So uh, we have already got the model here. So let's actually predict that. Let's just uh, do a quick plot. Uh, so here we can see uh, the number of labels that um, uh, the, the predictive algorithm has identified and uh, it might be easier just to plot a table. So here we can actually see um, how it's uh, done the predictions. Uh, it's done uh, very well for certain species, but uh, not uh, for all the species, as you can see uh, from this table here. And uh, we can get a quick um, uh, result of um, the accuracy. So it's 94%, um, but if we run uh, the algorithm again, you can see that based on uh, the sampling, uh, that we picked up uh, how well um, the training uh, model has been built and how well it predicts um, other test data. So uh, I'll run it a couple of times. Uh, so you can see it um, uh, again for this uh, sample data set, it varies anywhere between 94 to 98%. Um, Quite, quite good again oh there's a 92 there but uh, overall uh, it seems to be doing well uh, and on a very very rare occasion uh, it uh, it actually gives us 100 percent accuracy but uh, and that's uh, as you can understand um, in part because of um, the data that we use for uh, creating the model uh, gives you an idea in terms of um, how how you should create the right um, set of data uh, for your model and um, using which how well you can predict outcomes. So again, this uh, this wraps up uh, another video in the series for machine learning with R. Hope you like the video. Do subscribe if you want to stay updated on other future videos on R, machine learning, and big data. Thanks everyone for watching.